Hello, my, my name is Steve Johnson, and I'd like to welcome you to the uh, CNS and Electronics uh, Senior Projects this year. Uh, this is a totally new experience for our students because we're doing this virtual this year. So um, I'll say bear with us a little bit, but um, the way the program is going to work is there will be live streams on YouTube within our channel, and each group will basically have their own live stream. So we'll start with the poster boards, and then we'll go into the presentations, and then about 11 o'clock we'll be doing awards. So um, that's kind of the layout of the program. If you look in the channel under the about, um, you can actually find a link that will send you to the program that we have for the senior projects. And there is also a link to vote for the best project. So um, we're going to start walking through and doing um, basically the poster board presentations with each group. So we're going to start here with the the um, fishing group, and if you can, Jeff. Yeah, so, okay. 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 And so the first group here is an automated fishing fisherman, automated fisherman. And if you could tell us a little bit about your project. Yeah, sure thing. Um, I'm David with the automated fisher fisherman group. I'm also joined by Nathan and Riley. So the purpose of what we did is we decided to go and automate a fishing pole. So it is run by a, a motor. We go through and then we have a flexible sensor on the end that will de detect any deflections, which is uh, locking into our, uh, our fish bite. So with that, we're, it's all controlled by an HMI with Nathan's going to go over shortly. We have some of our programming that will go into more depth when we uh, actually get into the presentation. But with that, I'll introduce Nathan and he'll go over like the HMI. All right, so sneak around here. All right, so uh, we'll go through here and we'll actually do, um, we'll kind of explain here what we have for our screen setup. Um, and then we'll go through and we'll do the actual setup um, and show how this all operates. So we start off um, at this home screen, this beginning screen here. Um, and the first thing you do um, is you set your water level. So you set um, the point where you want um, the lure or bait or wherever you want. Um, to sit. So you confirm that, you confirm that height, and then you go down uh, when you enter your fishing depth. So you enter um, how deep basically you want to have your lure sit. So um, we have this scaled to be in feet, so you enter it in um, in whatever um, amount of footage you want to be. Then after that, um, we have our fishing display. And our fishing display basically explains um, where you're at at all times. So it'll, it'll display what depth you're at, and feet and inches. Um, it gives your temperature, so what you're sitting at. Um, what your water temperature um, sitting here, we'll, we'll test this later. Um, and then your air temperature as well, we can also test that. Um, and then after that, um, we'll go in and we'll just show what it's like if you were to catch a fish and what you would see. So uh, we'll go ahead here and uh, see if you can see this. Uh, we'll go ahead and we'll hit begin. Um, right here, we would set the zero point um, to the water level. We're just gonna, you know, go with this as that is our water level um, for right now. So you confirm that. You would go to your automatic mode. Then let's just go down. Let's just go down two feet just for just for this presentation. Go down two feet. Confirm it. And as you can see, it tracks down. It goes down two feet below um, your set point. Um, so at this point, I'll hold the mic really. Take this, so we're gonna do. Um, I'm gonna just show the water temperature here. So right now it looks like air temp sitting at about oh 75 in here. And as you can see, this is a thing of ice water we have here, um, and it's dropping down obviously to what would be close to the freezing point. Um, so we'll go ahead here. We'll decide. Let's change the depth. So we'll go in. Uh, we're gonna change depth. So we're gonna go up. Let's go. Let's go one foot. So we'll go here. We'll change our depth. We'll confirm that. And now we're going to be sitting at one foot below our zero point or our water level. And then now, say um, we do get a fish bite in the end, like David was saying with this, this flex sensor, you can go ahead and bend it. Your fish light, fish on light comes on, um, releases back to that original zero point. And at this point, um, you can go in 
and say you're done fishing. Um, you want to sure you want to be done fishing? Yes, we do. Um, and we'll go back to the home screen as well. So um, that's basic rundown. We do also have um, on the back end of this um, a proximity sensor. And what that proximity sensor does, it's like an extra safety precaution. So at this point, uh, as it's sitting on the prox sensor, uh, we can't do anything. So until it is sitting off the prox sensor, um, we are not able to let line in, let line out, do any sort of um, fishing whatsoever. So if you wanted to reel in and reel out, none of these are going to work um, while it's sitting on that prox sensor. So, um, all right, I think I will uh, hand it over to Riley and he'll kind of go over the uh, panel itself and some of the hardware that we have. Well, to start, you can kind of see our original sketch of where we began with. We didn't know where we were going to go with this. Can't even really tell what it is. And then here, obviously, is our finished project. So it's kind of a pretty good accomplishment to go from something like that to an actual working design. Um, we had to usually, like where I work, all of our panels, it's just straight I.O. So we had to do a little bit of adjustment, adding a breadboard in. And getting wires to stay into a breadboard but for that we for our sensors which detect how much line is in or out we had to use a pull-up resistor on uh hall effect sensors which senses a magnetic field and goes close so we get a pulse to our plc so we can get a one shot to our counter so we can count line in and out then also our flex sensor we had to build a voltage divider because our card can only take zero to ten volts in so we had to use a breadboard for that too. And then you guys can see the inside of our panel. Tried to keep it as clean as possible because that's key for troubleshooting, being able to trace your wires. I think that's just about it. Okay, so that's the automated uh, fisherman, and basically it's a, I'll say a PLC project to automate uh, catching fish. Okay, so uh, we'll now move on to the um, automated, well, sorry, controllable MIDI, right? Okay, MIDI controller. MIDI controller. Okay, so uh, this is the MIDI controller. Uh, MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. Um, my name is Anna. This is Jacob, Jared, and then Daniel's over here. Um, this is basically an electronic music instrument. Uh, the design is a Moog, which is inspired by the first synthesizer that was ever created. Um, I'm just going to do a quick demo to show you what it can do. So there's 49 keys. Um, it can go an octave down, octave up. Then you got the drum pads, which are velocity sensitive. Using a material called Bellstat. And then you have a pitch bend, which uses a light sensor. I'm going to need to handle this. <laughs> Uh, the more light there is, uh, or the less light there is, the voltage goes down. Um, then you have 120 instruments that it can play. So, and back to the piano. Also has a volume knob and then a full volume button to ignore the volume knob, as well as a record of one track and a playback. And I'm going to have uh, whoever's next talk about the interior of this. All right. Uh, so on the interior of this, we have our Arduino Duo. As you can see, there's one up here. And it's kind of hidden underneath a proto board or shield where we have the multiplexer soldered in with a rat's nest of wires. Um, we also have the drum pad and the light sensor 
soldered into the proto shield. And then the piano keys are plugged in with a ribbon cable. Um, so this is a wooden box that we made out of pine and stained it and clear coated it to be able to fit everything in. And then we have a hinge door on the bottom so that we can open it up and get on the inside. But it's pretty messy if you see the picture up here. Um, so we have our circuit schematic here for about how everything's hooked up. You'll see that there's our functional buttons and our potentiometers and the drum pads are all in different areas and then connected to the Arduino. And then over here, you see the eight by eight matrix, which corresponds to how the Arduino Duo knows which key is being pressed. Mm -hmm. so we have 48 keys and through the eight by eight matrix, it figures out which mm -hmm. ones are being pressed at the same time or if only one's being pressed. Um, and then if you want to know a little more how the code works. Thank you. Uh, so the code was mostly a matter of one, figuring out how to send messages from the Arduino to the computer, and two, how to actually interpret the input. Um, so you have like a big flowchart of how the code works over here on the poster. And um, in order to send messages to the computer, we use a library called MIDI USB, which allowed us to construct packets of MIDI information and to send it to, to the computer where they are turned to a tone. So when I press a key like this, that's causing the Arduino to send a message to the computer and for the computer to play a tone as a result. As for requiring the inputs, we have a variety of different types of input attached to the Arduino, including the keys, drum pads, the pitch bend, and a variety of other, well, and a variety of other knobs and buttons. So one of the big focuses of the code was trying to interpret all of these different methods of input and to convert them into audible and pleasant sounds. Um, so for a little bit more about this project, here's Jacob. Thank you. So for the project, as far as the project goes, I went ahead and just wanted to show you a little bit about how it actually turns out playing itself. Here, could you hold this for a moment? Yeah. So speakers while I step here and... <laughs> As we as I hit each note, not only does it play each note one at a time, it also plays them all at the same time. So as a result of that flowchart that Daniel mentioned earlier, we're able to not only get each note playing as it should be, but we're also able to create full actual music with it instead of just having to do things one at a time, putting it into, say, a digital audio workstation, which we'll be going over later in our actual presentation. As for the MIDI device itself. This was a nice long journey for us. We learned quite a lot from doing this and we are quite looking forward to showing you exactly how we did all of this. Okay, so that's the uh, controllable MIDI and we'll move on to our next project, which is an automated uh, wood splitter. <clears throat> and this this is the automated wood splitter and they couldn't bring it in today i i really tried to get them to bring it in today but um they basically have some videos of it in use so so good morning my name's andrew dretz and this is our wood splitter upgrade and unfortunately, as Steve said, it would not fit in the elevator up here as much as we would like to show it off. But basically, it's a PLC project in which we're controlling a servo valve and driving the 
ram that pushes the log against the wedge as a typical hydraulic splitter works. But instead, we're using accumulators to make up for a smaller pump. So as you see here, this is the GIFs side-by-side uh, -side comparison. It ended up being about 2.7 times faster. Not quite our goal, but it's still a vast improvement. Yeah, we use the, uh, the BLC for control the speed and control the position of the RAM to make sure each, uh, each examinator use the machine is away and he know where is the RAM and how much speed he need. So we make the BLC control all that and the, make the examinator stay away to make the project the much safer we can reach. So the point of it is two hand control. So we need to make sure we control the valve and to control the speed of the RAM and the hydraulic. Uh, so with the wood, common wood splitter, you know, you're, it's normally a trailer, so you're pulling it here and there. Um, it's battery powered. Uh, to make up for that, we added a starter generator so it can actually be started from the HMI as well as maintain the battery um, to power the electronics on the device. Uh, we went with um, these OptiTouch sensors for two-handed control. They sense when your finger is in, um, in the groove here keeps the operator at the tail end of the splitter away from the moving parts. Um, we also position this e-stop on the top of the box so it can be hit from the side of the, the actual RAM itself. Um, a lot of, this project had a lot of everything in it, um, metal fab, electronics, um, design of the, all the metal parts themselves and whatnot. Um, as well as programming of the HMI and the PLC. Um, here's some of the parts we had to design, all the valve blocks for the hydraulics, um, custom encoder bracket, so it actually moves up and down when if there's wobble in the ram. And we added a magnetic brake on the bottom. Uh, the brake will stop the ram instantly when the e-stop is pressed. Um, it is also all uh electrically i don't know not isolated but it's um shuts off the electronics when the e-stop is pressed using a, a master control relay let's see what else do i have to talk about for our plc um thanks to cascade engineering we used the old slick 505 processor um we did a rotary encoder uh, the electronic valve magnetic brake and the two-handed control um, that's about it for our, I'll hand it back to Drew for some final. And then the last thing to touch on was not only does the brake stop the ram if you hit the e-stop, but if you let go of the two-hand control at any point within the cycle. So that way, you know, if the log shifts or something, you can't just reach over and mess with it and potentially get in the way. So. Okay, so that's the automated log splitter. Uh, we have one more uh, project, and it is uh, my dorm. And this is uh, my dorm. It is, um, I'll say, uh, Internet of Things um, type project. So, yeah. So basically, like you said, kind of got Internet of Things home automation based product here. So you've got a door lock, a light, a heater that you can got hide behind there, and then we have a window, all which can be controlled from a website or using Amazon Alexa. And I'll show that off in a minute. I'll mute her so she doesn't get in our way. So general of Amazon Web Services running in the background, and we have a website here. When you interact with the website or you interact with Alexa, it's going to send messages to our Raspberry Pi microcomputers that we've got running in the background. You can see one of them behind the light here. And so when you send those messages, the Raspberry Pi receives it and runs it through some code. And then after it finishes up with the code, it's going to enact changes on the electrical controls. So Elizabeth, you want to talk about the electronics a little bit? 
So I'll talk about a couple of our details and then I'll hand it off to Abdul to get more into depth on the motor aspects of our project. So to begin with, we have our light here, which we can not only control through the website, but we also have a little push button here that if the student wanted to, could come in and manually control their room light. I don't know if you can see that. Then we also have our window, which our window is controlled with a motor, but we also had to include a sensor on the side. It's an ultrasonic sensor just to gauge the distance of the window so that if wanting to move the window manually or using the website, either way, the website and the system will know the distance of the window and then also know the distance the window needs to travel. Yeah, so if you in the, so in the bad situation and if the electric off or something and we disconnect the window from the motors, uh, after everything's back, the motor, the ultrasound system will, will uh, uh, readjust the motor back in the same position with the window. So the the window, the super motor works as you see over here. We have uh, chips, uh, driver chips. So we connect the enable to uh, the power the five voltage to keep it like always a high signal that's going to close the circuit inside and we can uh, feed the input and control the motors by feeding the input so we have like four inputs so if we go from one to four that's going to run the motor forward and if we like uh, feed it from four to one backward gonna be reversed motor also on this side we have the solenoid locks so we can uh, unlock the door by using your student id and if we swipe the student id the card reader will send you send the signal to the buy and the buy will uh, check the id number and will send the signal to solenoid to unlock the door and Jeremiah will show you how that's work. Yeah so like Abdul said we've got the, the door swipe as one way to unlock the door but the rest of our controls are based off of the website and off of Alexa if you want to show the website a little bit here. So I'm going to talk about how this works while I'm making a couple of changes happen. So we've got our website here globally available. So we've got switches for a couple of different things. We've got some push buttons and sliders. It's like right here, I have a dimmer switch. And if I want my lights to be a little bit dimmer, I can just click there and you can see that the light just dimmed accordingly. Um, so we've got the door swipe as well. If you don't want to swipe your card and you just want to use the website, you can click this button and you'll hear that unlock. And then additionally, we're going to use Alexa here to control this window. So if I say, Alexa, tell Ferris State my dorm to open my window to 75%. So Alexa hears that message, and then we'll start to move the window accordingly. So basically what's happening in the background here is whether you're talking to Alexa or you're sending a message to and from the website, those messages are being sent through Amazon's cloud infrastructure. And when the cloud infrastructure hears that, our Pies are also listening for that same message and will run them through their custom code to figure out what's going on. So if you send... The if you click the button to unlock the door, for example, it's going to send a message that says door unlocked. And then the Raspberry Pi that we have hooked up to the solenoid of the door lock will hear that message. And if that's the right message it's listening for, it'll send out input or output on its pins to unlock the door, sending a message to the solenoid. So all that code was more Jeff's wheelhouse. So I'm going to pass this to him to talk about that a little bit. So as previously mentioned by Jeremiah, our Raspberry Pis were kind of the intermediary between the website and the electrical controls designed by Elizabeth and Abdul. Basically, the main challenge was to uh, decipher what was coming down from the website. Sorry. Coming down from the website, <clears throat> whether it was a change physically or a change on the website. So say if somebody swiped their door, that sends a message to the website which then in return, the website acknowledges that and sends a message back. So the challenge was to decipher logic that would determine whether it was a change physically or on the website. <clears throat> and 
uh, inversely, if somebody made a change on the website, came down, <clears throat> like I said previously, they would have to determine how that worked. Um, so I'll get into more detail about this in the presentation, but a few flow charts here kind of identify how that works. And um, altogether, uh, the pies control about the four, the four subsystems, which are the door lock, the heater, uh, the window, and the light. And we we have one of them visible right here, the light pie, but the rest are hidden behind here in our guts, which I don't know if you can see with the camera. <clears throat> Hidden in the back there. And that's all we have. Okay, so that's um, our four projects. Um, presentations will actually begin at nine o'clock. And so we have about a half hour until then, and students will basically uh, prepare for those presentations right now. So um, we will actually start another live stream for the beginning of the presentation. So um, tune in then.